on in the week. The question though, do you have spiritual thirst? Do you experience something from God but want to know more of God? Are you in some way dissatisfied? That you really want, that you hunger and thirst for more of God? Jesus says, is anyone thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. Now this uh, passage begins on the greatest day of the festival. Now this is actually the festival of the tabernacles. And it's no coincidence that Jesus says these words at that festival. The tabernacle is a tent, a dwelling place. The Israelites remembered when they were dwelling with God in the desert, and then later on in the... Do you want, do you want to move the thing there, Tom? The Israelites remembered their dwelling with God in the desert. This is what the, the feast commemorates, the dwelling of God with his people. And so when Jesus stands up, and we know he's talking about the Holy Spirit, He's talking about the dwelling of God within his people. There were three feasts in the Jewish year. This was the last one, and it was a seven-day feast. But on the eighth day, the great day of the feast, it was a culmination, not just of this feast, but all three. It was the end of the festal year. Early on in the morning, that the priests would have gone to the pool of Shiloh and would have taken the waters of Shiloh and would have brought them to the temple in a gold cup. It's not in the Bible, this is the, 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 the Jewish tradition. And that week, and if you add up the sacrifices that have gone on that week, the whole week there's 199 different sacrifices. The last ten were on that day. And as the morning sacrifices are offered, the priest would pour out this water, which was mingled with wine at that point, onto the sacrifices. And all the people rejoiced with a great joy. Now put yourself in the situation, in the crowds there. It's very easy to imagine now a blistering heat that they would have had there in the Middle East. Imagine how packed it was, because every Jewish male would have the obligation to come to the feast. And not just them, but there were the invitations for the family too. For the Jewish people and for strangers, all within their household. It would have been packed. It would have been hot. There would have been a smoke rising up from the sacrifices. Amongst the crowds, there would have been water cellars, because they didn't have tap water. They'd have like a backpack or sort of a jug thing on the back, and they would distribute water. And all the people were rejoicing, as commanded. Put yourself there in that crowd. And they... A voice is detected amongst the crowd. Is anyone thirsty? Initially, you're probably going to dismiss that, or it's just another water cellar. But he says, is anyone thirsty? Come unto me and drink. And then he starts talking about living water. About something coming from the inside. And you can imagine how around him the people would have silenced and then maybe a little gap would have 
appear. And there is this lone figure standing there, calling out on this great day of the feast, is anyone thirsty? If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and let them drink. The one who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow out of their belly. No one arrested him. But how arresting are those words? Let us consider the words of Jesus as he speaks, as he shouts, moreover. He begins then with, if anyone. Isn't the gospel a gospel of if anyone? If anyone would take up their cross, would, sorry, would follow me, let them take up their cross. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I will come into them and see and sup with them or eat with them. If anyone, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is open to anyone. That's how Jesus begins. It does not matter what your sin is. <coughs> sin is not a problem. Now, of course, some of you are thinking, well, of course sin's a problem. Sin's a massive problem. But let us look at this and, uh, and understand what I'm saying here. Because some people will come and they say, oh, I can't come to God. You don't know what I've done. Do you have people say that to you? They say, oh, I've been too bad. I've done this, that and the other. You don't know my sin. Jesus still says, if anyone. So what's the logic behind this? Because sin very much matters to God. Well, you notice it says, the Holy Spirit was not there yet because Jesus has not yet been glorified. Particularly in John's Gospel, he uses this phrase about Jesus being glorified and he's talking about Jesus being first lifted up on the cross and then exalted in the resurrection. That is Jesus' glorification. And the Holy Spirit did not come before then. The Holy Spirit comes after Jesus' death and resurrection. And the logic for that is then very simple, isn't it? Because what is the purpose of Jesus' death? It is to pay for sin. And the resurrection confirms that that offering was acceptable before God. So first of all, and Jesus is looking forwards then to the time when the Spirit would be given, first of all there is the paying for sin, there is the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and then he's lifting up into heaven after that, after his death and resurrection. That's then how Jesus can say, if anyone come unto me. Because Jesus has made the provision for sin. And we all know this, don't we? But it helps to hear it again, to hear the truths again. So that when we are talking with someone and they give that classic line, oh, I've been too bad, we can still say that Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, I will give them living water. But there's the other side of the coin here. We've said there how open the gospel is. How all-inclusive. But it is also exclusive. 
What does Jesus say? Whoever believes in me. Jesus gives that offer then for anyone to come, a wide offer, but it is narrowed down to that focus. Whoever believes in me. The Gospel, according to the Book of Romans, is by, by faith from first to last. In Galatians it says, we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Faith is the thing that is required. Faith is the exclusive thing that it all homes in on. If anyone thirsts, let them come, let them drink. Whoever believes, they receive. That is the basic offer. So the limit then is placed by the person themselves. Just as we saw here, the limit to how much oil was poured out was placed on how many jokes that the woman put there. What limits the Holy Spirit coming to a person is a person's faith. Jesus says, whoever believes. And it's not just to believe in anything, but specifically it's a belief in what? Well done, Brenda. In Jesus. Believe, believes in me. We live in a Britain, don't we, where we hear again and again, well, all roads lead to Rome. You're just going up your side of the hill, people tell you, don't they? But I'm going up a different way. The truth, which is in the true word of God, declares that we must believe in him. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. Now people then oppose this and they say, oh, that, you're very arrogant, aren't you? Don't people say that to you? Oh, you just think you're right and we're wrong. Yeah. Who are you to say that you go to heaven and we don't? You get these sort of object objections, don't you? People saying that to you. Well, the answer to that is, well, I'm not excluding you. You say, I'm being arrogant, saying, well, I believe, I believe then that I go to heaven through Jesus. And I believe then that you're not going if you don't believe in him. But actually, it's not me who's excluding you. It's you yourself. People themselves, non-Christians, when they talk with them, they are the ones putting the barrier. We say, actually, the same faith that I have is open to you. Jesus says then, if anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes, rivers of living water. Let's consider that phrase, rivers. Who's a King James fan? Well, I'm with you on this one. Jesus says rivers here. Now, the NIV thinks, oh, he's exaggerated a bit, and they've made it into streams. But rivers is what Jesus says. Think of rivers. Just to help us a little away along this, the, 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 the Greek word is potom, potomos, which where we get the word hippopotamus from. Hippopotamus literally means the horse of the river. You show a hippopotamus a stream and he's not going to be in Probably drink it, yes, we've got it one gulp, yes. <laughs> when Jesus says rivers, the people know what a river means. The Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris. Rivers which are as wide as Rothley in some places. Rivers which are deep. Rivers which are full of crocodiles and hippos. This is the word Jesus is using. Imagine how that is going to grab the attention of the thirsty people in the temple that morning when they hear of rivers flowing. They let 
letters in the New Testament, they explain a little bit what's gone on in the Gospels, and they, they unpack it a little. In Ephesians, Paul talks of being filled with the Spirit. That's probably a very known, well-known verse. But in his prayer, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, listen to this, what Paul's prayer is. Ephesians 3, 19. And try and get your head round this. He prays that you might be filled with the fullness of God. That's why Jesus is saying rivers here. And not streams or brooks of the rivers. You, uh, Paul prays that the church be filled with the fullness of God. Now I can't get my head round that. God for whom the universe is just a little small box. He could fill it a million times. And yet Paul prays for the church and that's applied to us today that we might be filled with the fullness of God. God. What are we going to be filled with? Jesus then says that they're going to be filled with rivers of living water. We've all seen this week our front lawns or back lawns getting rather yellow. And we've rejoiced when a bit of rain has come and a little bit of green is about coming through, yes? Now put yourselves in the Middle East. You think of their long, hot summers and how dry and parched the grass is. How a lot of places just revert back to desert. And in that situation, they knew the rainy season when the rains would come and rivers would flow in the desert, and they call them wadis, don't they? And if you've seen on the TV these speeded up videos that they show, it's got like a whole month compressed into a few seconds. They show the rain falling and they show the desert burst into life, don't they? All of a sudden what used to be sand is shrubs and grass and flowers, and the trees get leaves. They knew what a difference that living water made. A living water, by the way, is just the expression that they use. When we say fresh water, they say living water. But a wonderful, um, a wonderful picture it gives for our English tongue. When we think then of, of, of the picture that is being given here, we think of the transforming effect of water. It doesn't say paint will flow out of your innards, yeah? Or oil or any other thing, but water, living water. There's that picture of transformation. The transformation you get in the desert. The transformation you get on your lawn at home when water comes. A few scriptures. John 6, 63. It is the Spirit that gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The Spirit gives life. Romans 8, 2. It is the Spirit of life. Again and again, the Spirit is linked with life. Now, who wants that spiritual life now? Yes, on the day when Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me, and if anyone who believes, they'll receive rivers of living water. They'll receive life. What a shame it is for other day of all the things we put into our bodies, hoping to feel a bit better. Whether it's an innocent cup of coffee or Mars bar, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's cigarettes, we put things in hoping to get better. Jesus gives an offer of a, a living water, something that gives life. Now just by the way, just looking a little deeper here, it's interesting how John's Gospel progresses. Because John is the sort of person, when he writes, he starts a theme, 
and then he leaves it and he builds on it a little bit, a little bit later. And then he leaves it and he builds on it again. It's interesting how God uses the human agent in the writing of his word. Now, in the beginning of John's Gospel, you have the wedding of Cana. And the, um, uh, the, the chief of ceremonies is invited to taste the water that had become wine. So just to taste on the tongue. Then that moves on. You get the story of the woman by the well. And the offer for her of a spring of water welling up from the inside. And now we move on here. We move from the spring to a river of water. We have that progression. We have the same progression in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, very similar words to this, Revelation 21. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And by the next chapter, we progress to rivers again. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. We have this ever-widening, ever-increasing flow of water which is coming. And it culminates in John's Gospel after the resurrection then, so after the payment of sin, remember what we said earlier, first we have the payment of sin, then anyone can drink. And after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. And what does he say? Peace be with you. As my Father has sent me, I am now sending you. And he breathes and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The barrier of sin is gone. And he breathes out the Holy Spirit. To the disciples. It is very interesting here, John's take on this, and this really helps us practically today. In, in Luke's Gospel, we have a lot about asking for the Holy Spirit. Ask and you shall receive. In John's Gospel, it is all Jesus is doing. Jesus is the one who goes to the Father, who asks for the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who stands in front of the disciples and breathes. We say the best till last. And Jesus has saved the best till last. And he says, so whoever believes in me out, so believes in me out of them shall flow rivers of living water. And then he says, out of their belly. Or out of their innermost parts. It's quite unusual when you think of it. If you go back to the temple scene where we are, with the other people selling water or whatever, and Jesus comes along and he says, if anyone's thirsty, come and have a drink. Now, what's the usual way you satisfy your thirst? You drink and it goes into your belly. Jesus talks here about the living water that starts from within, starts from within the belly, and flows out from there. We have a wonderful picture here of Christianity, a wonderful picture of the one true faith. Because all other religions and all other ways of living, it is an outward uh, imposition on yourself. Yeah? There is a law placed on you and you do your best to follow it. Through whatever strength you can muster up. Here, the offer that Jesus gives is coming from the inside out. When we read, for instance, the, um, the fruit of the Spirit, or the gifts of the Spirit, and things like that in the New Testament, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, and all these things. 
We can read that in our sinful flesh, it can become a burden to us, can't it? Oh, I've got to be self-controlled. Oh, I've got to be joyful and loving. But what Jesus is offering is this that comes from the inside out, from deep within us. From deep within, from the Holy Spirit comes that love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, etc., etc. How do Christians survive in this modern world? How are we going to survive with the constant pressures from the outside? It is when we have that river of living water flowing from the inside out. Come to Jesus. Come and drink. The only thing that, that if you like, is our part is our faith. And we accept our faith. We believe. Believe Jesus' word. But that is a question for us to, to ponder. Do I really believe that? Or where do I come before the Lord in prayer? It's not about me summoning up anything. It's that simple faith. Jesus has said, come to me. Whoever believes in me is going to receive the life. It's that faith. Faith, faith, faith. Let us pray.